evening, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us. Um, tonight, we're welcoming Adam Greenspan, who's the directing partner of PWE Landscape Architecture in Berkeley, California. Um, oh, and I should introduce myself. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Phoebe Lippar. I'm a professor in landscape architecture here at the School of Architecture. Um, I've known Adam for 15 years, I think. Uh, we met when I went out to Berkeley, California one summer for an internship following my first year of graduate school. And we bonded over a shared fascination for plants. And then years later, over uh, the trials of sleep deprivation associated with new babies, house renovations, um, too much work travel. Um, but over those 15 years, uh, the first eight from within the office where we worked together, and then the next seven for me from the outside looking in. Um, it's been extraordinary to witness the evolution of a practice as it grapples with what we might call the evolutionary turn of our contemporary time. PWP under Adam's leadership has brought forward a welcoming tradition of craft in building landscapes and translating ideas to physical form while integrating new complexities associated with living systems and social dynamics. The firm's recent series of large-scale public landscapes um, represents an expertise at the highest level of practice gained through decades of accrued knowledge about the materials of landscape, of course, um, but also about the politics and processes associated with building um, exquisitely in the public realm. And yet, with each new project, um, the practice seems to bring with it new experimentations, an indication of the impetus to push the envelope just a little further. While often the work of established firms becomes predictable, it seems that PWP is on an ever-increasing approach. Adam has a background in art, sociology, and horticulture, an extensive experience, as I'm sure we'll hear tonight. Uh, working with architects, artists, communities, and cities. He's President Emeritus of the Landscape Architecture Foundation and was recently honored with the Beatrix Brand Achievement Award in Landscape Architecture. So please help me in uh, welcoming Adam Greenspan. <laughs> Thanks, Phoebe, and thank you, everyone, for having me here tonight. Um, very happy to visit uh, over here uh, at UT Austin and uh, see alumni from the office as well as the program uh, that I know. Um, I'm here talking about, I think, as Phoebe mentioned, basically uh, creating landscape through time and looking at time through landscape and the transitions in time and change in an office uh, and a firm. And I have a lot of technology and contraptions on me that I need to just quickly acclimate to. So uh, one moment. Okay. Um, Peter Walker, I mean, and our office has really been focused on creating places that stick in your memory that can also, by doing that, create shared space and a shared identity for communities, uh, cities, uh, and society. As we've been doing that over the years, though, what began as public plazas, roof decks, small parks, has become very complex and very large projects that are focused not only on the creation of physical and hardscape constructed spaces, but also living systems uh, and projects that hopefully endure over time, but change quite significantly over time. And here you can see on the left is Boeing Longacre Park, a corporate headquarters built on a constructed wetlands, Newport Civic Center Park in Newport Beach, uh, which was a project that I worked on with Phoebe, actually, um, which is a city hall and civic center inside and adjacent to uh, a desert garden. And then the Sydney Olympic Park, uh, a restored landscape that was a brown field where contaminated soils and contaminated ground is stored in the iconic uh, mounds that you see there that punctuate this regional park. While we're always trying to compete with and, and against um, our other landscape architects practicing today, what we really look towards, and this is something that 
Pete Walker uh, has always brought up is the projects and the landscapes that have uh, endured over time. And so the competition that we're looking at is not only our uh, peers to get current projects, but really when you get a project and you build a project, uh, how do you design one and construct it so that it has the potential to endure through time? And that's not just with the way that it's constructed, um, but it's also how the design and uh, it as an entity of its own connects with its context. What we try to do is make places that engage their context using materials and systems of the world. And that now ranges from animals and plants to minerals, to society, uh, to the economy, as well as conceptual and temporal systems. And we do that in a creative process of collaboration in one studio. Uh, and this is our studio in Berkeley where it all happens. It looks kind of like your studio over here. Um, we pin up, but we also show things digitally all the time and really all gather around. Um, and I think the idea of a multi-generational office is something that um, is taking on new life, you know, as we move from Pete's efforts, which have gone on for perhaps uh, 60 years in landscape architecture, um, to the next set of generations. Uh, and because the work that we do and the material that we work with does have the potential to last much longer than in any one person's life, uh, I think the work has changed in what it aspires to. As Phoebe mentioned, I uh, have been focused on plants and always had an attraction uh, and uh, an engagement with plants as well as art. Um, Pete really was focused on art uh, and maybe hardscape early on. Um, when I began, he'd been practicing probably for 40 years. And when I began, he said he's begun to realize that trees might have the biggest impact in designs uh, that he worked on. And that's something he only saw, say, 40 years into the process. So we overlapped very well. Um, and I think then we have been able to expand the focus of the work that we do. I think at its heart, though, is creating projects that are pragmatic, that are iconic uh, or identifiable, but also focused on the actual materials uh, of landscape and the materials of nature. So this is the Tanner Fountain at Harvard. Um, really a simple coming together of asphalt, stone, a tree, and some lawn. Um, but it's the way that, that those elements go through time, both through the year uh, and through the seasons, but also through decades. Um, that really is, I think, special. Here at UT Austin Speedway is a similar focus on a limited set of materials um, to really create something that has the potential to withstand the kind of use and the kind of uh, endurance needed for the central path and gathering space of campus. But it's really making the design out of just the paving material, the light fixtures, which are already a campus standard, and then the drain at the center of it all. A lot of the projects we're working on are much more complex than that now. Um, and what we've tried to do is maximize minimalism in a way. If in a small space you can pare it down to two materials, in a large space focused on ecological systems and goals, um, what we've tried to do is create places that are memorable and identifiable um, because of their apparent simplicity, but the simplicity uh, sort of engulfs a lot of complexity within that. At Glenstone, a 230-acre sculpture park uh, outside of Washington, DC. We've been working with the owner for about 15 years. And in that time, we expanded from what was uh, about 40 acres of private land to what's now 230 acres. And we worked in master planning to define the extents of that um, 230 acres. And what you can see is we've been aiming to work to an edge which goes to a high point if the red and the yellow are the highest points in this topography uh, around what are two streams that come together around the main central site. And by not paying attention or not focusing on the boundaries, the political boundaries of each plot of land, we've been focusing on what the natural order and the natural topographic reasoning is uh, in this area so that we can collect all the water that falls uh, in this region, treat it, filter it, 
um, and then restore the creeks that it goes to so we can collect the water, use the water, but also create a better environment over time. <clears throat> and so this idea of the way that water flows was a central idea of how a place that's really focused on art, architecture, and landscape came together uh, and really has been the reason that it's grown to the size that it's grown, um, as well as trying to create a place uh, that blends together and creates a seamless integration of art, architecture, and nature where the rolling hills allow water to flow uh, smoothly across the ground to infiltrate into a gr the ground, but also the peaks and the high points mean that people from the city, when they come to this place, really have all of suburbia sort of screened and blocked out with restored woods. What you see here on the left is the landscape master plan overall. Um, on the right is the tree planting plan. Every different color here is a different species of tree. Um, and through the two phases and 15 years that we've worked, we've planted about 8,000 new trees uh, on the site um, of 60 plus native species. But that's always been done to focus on really the character and the experience uh, of the place to create some place that um, really has impact and that's a surprise for people coming from downtown DC or coming from adjacent areas in the suburbs. What we proposed early on was that we would use the site as a nursery because there were many fantastic trees, but they were strewn around the site, planted by homeowners over the years. Um, this was a site that was meant to be uh, subdivided and was going to be 20 different houses, um, but it ended up being only two houses and had all of these different trees, the different colors again represent different species. We lifted those trees and moved them into new groupings and orientations to highlight the scale of the property. And when we lifted them, we were able to regrade the ground so that rather than engineered slopes and ditches that were common in creating pads for new houses in a subdivision, the ground is now the smooth contours of a rolling river valley. We also then added to that new trees to create a design, to create meaning and direction uh, in the landscape that people could follow. And this was the phase one of the project, half of the project and opened in 2006. Of those 200 trees that were moved in that first uh, phase, some of them were tree spaded. Some of them were dug and made into uh, flat pancake balls and moved across the site. The largest of which was about a 30 foot wide root ball uh, three to five or six feet thick. Um, it's about an 80 year old sycamore and it became one of the sort of touchstone landmarks um, that's part of the entrance experience and the arrival and movement of visitors onto the site. So what happened by doing that, moving all of the trees and planting the new trees, um, we end up getting this seamless connection of very smooth contours a new museum that came uh, and opened just last year, and then about 80 acres of restored woodland all around, connecting existing woodlands on different parts uh, of the uh, site and uh, adjacent properties. From here, you can see where visitors come. This foundation is open to the public. The public drives in and parks in these parking groves. This whole area had been a dead end street with nine houses on it. Um, it's been reforested and the forest is a compilation of uh, 30 native species. Each of those species um, are used uh, and then pulled out to make the grove. <clears throat> so the most abundant species in the native woodlands nearby uh, is the tulip poplar. Tulip poplars line this drive when you go in, you have white oaks over here, which are part of this woods, red oaks here, and sycamores here. And those trees make up this, uh, this new woodland. So in the fall especially, you begin to see these different species and then see connections from the parking groves out. The parking groves are gravel and permeable. The rainwater goes through those and is collected in a cistern that then becomes an irrigation source for this part of the project. I can't get control of this. 
Um, <laughs> as you walk through, you come through the forest edge, walk across one of those restored creeks on a bridge, through the forest edge, and then out into this rolling meadow. The meadow might look like it's always been there. It was regraded and heightened in order to create uh, basically uh, a landscape that opens up as you move forward. But these rolling hills that allow water to infiltrate and then move uh, along natural contours. Across the fields, what looks like a collection of different volumes and different buildings um, is your destination. That's the museum. When you get to the museum, though, you go downstairs or down an elevator, and the first view that you get down the stairs is this across um, a wetland garden, which is the water court in the center of that space. And what you find out is that rather than being um, separate buildings set on a knoll, they're connected by a link that's underneath the knoll and brings you around. So as you move through this space, you go into these gallery spaces and into these pavilions, experience art, uh, some of them changing exhibits, some that are always the same, and you come out and focus on the central water court space, um, which is all wetland plants that change very rapidly through the year. The wetland garden in the water court is based on the way that wetland plants naturally grow. So some species can only grow in shallow water and uh, others grow in very deep water, and some can move around. And so this range of plants was what was uh, sort of planted here and attracts a lot of native wildlife uh, into the center of the, the museum. But what it also means is that <clears throat> by figuring a way of creating a subsurface uh, topography, um, we allow some of the plants to move over time while also um, not allowing the ones that can grow only in shallow water to grow in the deeper water. So you can see here from this window, um, which is right up here looking this way, in the winter, the water lilies die completely down and so you get a big long reflecting pond with gold and yellow leaves of the, of the more um, rush-like and iris-like plants. During the spring, the plants begin to come back and you get something that's sort of in between. And then in the summer, you have a very full uh, planting area and a full garden. But this composition is one that's shifting and changing through the year. And over time, the species will move around and shift and change. This is a diagram uh, or a set of diagrams on the right that show the different depths of water with the darkest being the deepest and the lightest being the shallowest. And on the left, what you see uh, is the actual um, water court under construction with rib walls that allow the levels of the substrate below to be, uh, to be set at different heights. <clears throat> this is during peak bloom in the middle of summer after the plants had been installed for about a year. And above you can see the native perennial meadow that comes up over that link uh, running around the court. What happens in here is that even though we were working with a big uh, host of uh, team members. Arab engineers had studied the reflection and the amount of light transmitted from the outdoors into the building. What really isn't understood very well and can't be modeled very well is what kind of microclimate you get in these nooks and crannies. This is south and the sun hits this glass and bounces back into the water. And so we didn't know what plants would work well and live and what plants wouldn't. We had an idea, but we couldn't be sure. And since this is in the middle of this building, um, what we wanted to be able to do was change those depths within the garden and change and be able to change the species if we needed to, depending on how things went. Luckily, they're all doing quite well right now. And this is a biofiltration system underneath the water level. So that gravel substrate is what pulls water through the gravel uh, and the microorganisms within the gravel is what uh, filters and cleans the water before it comes back out. As you look down and as people come around and look at the water court again and again after each of their experiences with the different art pieces, you begin to get sort of almost an archaeological understanding of the below, uh, of, the, of the building beneath the water surface, which is really for the plants, but you also get fantastic reflections of the building uh, on the water surface itself. 
When you come out of there, you continue on what can be about a mile long walk on trails and paths through the property. This is looking back uh, at the portion of the meadow that's on structure. Um, and you can continue to the first museum, which was uh, done and opened in 2006. That building sits on the only uh, irrigated lawn in the project, and all of the water that lands on its roof and all of the water that lands on the lawn rolls down the lawn and goes into this pond, which is the next source of irrigation for the rest of the property uh, on this side. The water's filtered either through uh, a wetland edge uh, of wetland planting, as you see here, or um, through the stacked stone wall, which lines what the other side of the pond. And that stacked stone wall is a dry stacked stone wall. So the water that's coming down as runoff from the lawn and the irrigation that might have contaminants in it or, or some fertilizers goes first through the wall and through the sand inside of the wall before it comes into the water. This is the native perennial meadow with um, a piece by Richard Serra called Contour 290. Uh, the piece curves on the 290 contour uh, and is about 250 feet long and a 15 feet tall. As you move through the property, you see other sculptures and other pieces by different artists. Uh, the middle on the top is uh, Tony Smith piece. On the right is Ellsworth Kelly. Um, on the bottom right is a Andy Goldsworthy piece that has a giant ball of clay uh, 12 feet tall inside of it that came from the excavation of that uh, location. Um, and in the middle bottom is uh, called Split Rocker by um, Jeff Coons. Continuing down the steps, you get to a trail which takes you around and next to the restored streams. Um, and this is a boardwalk that moves across those streams and across the wetland and brings you back to uh, the access up through the meadow and back to the rest of the project. At the highest point on the property uh, and in the project is the split rocker piece. It's entirely organically maintained, but it's entirely planted with annuals. So this is something that has to be replanted each year, um, but in a way is not quite the seamless integration of art, architecture, and landscape, but um, an art integration of those things. What we were really happy to see, and we see every time we go, um, is the colonization and return of all different kinds of wildlife in all different places. Some of them right next to and on the architecture, others underneath the bridge when you come across. People are scared of some of them, people are excited to see some of them, but a lot of people and school groups that come here for reasons that had nothing to do with wildlife or plants end up getting to have an experience with wildlife and plants. And that's something that we try to do in all of our projects these days. In Sydney, on the waterfront, the uh, Sydney Opera House is over here. We entered a competition to do a master plan for uh, a three kilometer long uh, waterfront uh, some years ago. And we didn't win that master plan competition. Uh, but when the other team won, the government came back to us to design the park on the headland site, which is a one kilometer long portion of that three uh, kilometer long space. And this is taking what was for about a hundred years, uh, a container port that was cut down from um, a headland, which is a rocky knoll that comes out and lands in the water. And it had been a container port, like I said, for 100 years where containers were uh, brought here from uh, various places around the world and shipped off uh, in Australia and vice versa. The idea that we had was to connect everything with a continuous waterfront edge uh, and to make that waterfront edge uh, out of stone that was uh, sourced and quarried from the site from the basements of these uh, new towers that were part of the project that um, we didn't win, um, as well as from the area underneath our site, which was going to become parking lots and parking structures subgrade. What our goal was, was to build up from the water level to the historic neighborhood above, which had been separated from the water for 100 years since the area had been turned into the logistics space for the container port. And so by making a very, very vertically terraced park, 
um, with a large knoll on top, we were connecting that neighborhood and the rest of Sydney down to the water's edge and then connecting the water's edge all around um, to other developed areas. You can see here uh, a view and an image of that cut. It was about an 80 foot uh, tall cut into the native sandstone. And what we didn't know when we started but turned out to be true is that sandstone continues down. Um, and so what we were able to do was use the sandstone from the site uh, to create the edge rather than riprap or uh, concrete, and then to reform the hill or create uh, a semblance of, of the hill that estimated the form of the historical landform and the historical headland. And that was done through modeling that you can see on the right, aiming at a sort of historical uh, drawing of that knoll. And when you look at other headlands around Sydney, and this is one uh, that goes into the water, what you can see is that the base of the headland is eroded sandstone because as the water works against it, parts cleave off. And so you always see this rim of stone and then heavy vegetation. And so that became our design for uh, an exposed stone edge, an area for pedestrians and cyclists and then a very steep terraced uh, slope up to uh, the area above connecting to the city with a bushwalk, a trail that runs zigzagging up uh, that elevation. And these are images of different headlands and what you can also see is that the sandstone, which is laid in layers over time, through seismic activity sometimes is expressed in uh, horizontal lines and sometimes vertical lines and that effect was what we ended up using uh, in the design of the, of the water's edge. So these are images of the stone being actually quarried out from the area underneath what was paved in concrete uh, in the container port. Um, and these are about one meter wide by two to three meters long or four meters long. And by using a set width of one meter wide, we were able to do a design that was buildable, you know, by people on the other side of the world where the, the uh, stone could be cut out like brownies in a baking pan and then uh, assembled on site. And you can see that here. And so rather than um, being uh, an edge that was made of concrete and vertical, which wouldn't allow for any wildlife in the water to use any nooks and crannies on it, and rather than a riprap edge, which wouldn't allow people to walk down, this allows people on the land to come and experience the water and animals and plants in the water uh, to come up to the tidal zone. What it also does is it registers the sea level, the up and down of the, of the tide each day, but also the sea level over time. Um, and this, the levels of each of these areas for public use were set to be above sea level rise uh, till a certain date. But what this also does, it will allow people to see that rise and that change over time as the high and low water um, comes closer and closer uh, to this usable path. What's happened is it's become a real habitat for people uh, as well as uh, flora and fauna. All of the planting here is um, plants or are plants that are native to the Sydney area, native to Australia, but also specifically native, native to Sydney. And people really use it up and down, uh, up the stairs and up the blocks, uh, top to bottom. On top, we have a large grassy knoll where there can be big events. The day that I went, because I was tagging trees for a different project that I'll show in a moment, there was a big festival and I got to experience uh, you know, a fantastic uh, gathering from people uh, all around the area. And the activity happens at every level and every point in the project even underneath the landform. So one thing that we maintained was uh, a void space underneath the constructed ground. And so this is that wall that you saw in that first photo maintained with a skylight above or, or an open, uh, basically a light well that allows light down. And this is a cultural space that will become a museum someday underneath uh, that landform. It's an area for community events and gatherings and you can see this is all happening outside of 
uh, one of the historic buildings nearby uh, in the cove uh, and on that uh, constructed edge. So what we've been doing is moving from, uh, in this presentation, from what looks like a very natural landscape with glenstone through something that looks like one, but you then begin to realize it's not perfectly natural because you can get underneath it and inside of it to something that really doesn't look natural, I don't think, in any way from a distance, which is Salesforce Transit Center. Um, it's really the Transbay Transit Center, but then Salesforce donated some money to maintain it afterwards, so they got the name. So it's a public space and a public place that was the result of a design competition um, in uh, 2006. So it takes a long time for our projects uh, to be realized. Um, Cameron here uh, has worked on a couple of these uh, before he returned to Austin. Um, but in the competition, what we found was the site for this new multimodal transit center, which would be the station for buses, trains, and light rail uh, in downtown San Francisco. And it would also be the area of San Francisco where city planning planned for downtown and the highest high rises, which are up here above market on this uh, aerial photo to grow and become the area of the highest towers in San Francisco, we found that there was no public open space in this area. And that the public open space, um, which was the area of Union Square and Yerba Buena Gardens and South Park, three of the closest sort of neighborhood parks and plazas, if you put those areas together, you got the area, about five and a half acres, of our construction site. And so what we proposed in the competition was that instead of doing a fancy architectural roof, which was conceived of in glass in some of the briefing documents, um, you could do a fully occupiable public uh, green roof um, that could be fully occupiable by the public for a little bit more money, but not very much more money. And what we thought as a team with Atelier 10, Burrow Happold, and Pelly Clark Pelly Architects, as well as Heinz uh, developers, was that if this whole building was thought of as an organism that was really focused on transit or made because of transit, but ended up doing a lot more for the community, it could be something that would be a really generative part of uh, the change in the neighborhood of San Francisco as this new growth was happening all around it. And so this was the cross-section that we had during the competition where high-speed rail, if and when it comes to California, would have its last stop uh, in San Francisco in the basement, uh, two levels below the street level, that there would be a mezzanine level above that, a grand concourse or grand hall like the grand hall uh, or grand <coughs> concourse in Grand Central Station in New York, a retail mezzanine level, and then the bus deck level, one level below the roof where the roof park would be. What you can see in this, uh, this cross section though, is that the idea that we had as a team was to allow this to be naturally ventilated and naturally lit. And so to do that, there are a lot of skylights. This is the most dramatic. This is a light column which lets light from the roof all the way down through every level of the building and allows people to come into the grand concourse into a space that's filled with natural light. The buses are on this level because they come off the Bay Bridge, which is an elevated bridge that goes to an elevated uh, highway inside of San Francisco. And the off-ramp then takes those buses that come from the East Bay directly into this level, the second level from the top. So what we conceived together was that this park, which would be four blocks long and one block wide, could become the communal green space uh, you know, for this neighborhood. This tower was planned to be offices only, but new towers here, here, and also along this south side were all mixed use, residential, office, uh, and retail. And so in our competition, we had a bridge proposed at the fifth level from this tower. So people that were spending their day in the office here, looking down on the park, could come down and directly out onto the park. And when we ended up winning the project and winning the competition, we worked with the planning department in the city of San Francisco to require entitlements the, for the developers who got projects entitled for this property here and this property here to bridge directly onto the park. 
So they had to set a floor level at the same level as the park level. And they then were required by the city to make a public use in their building at that level. <clears throat> because what we felt was that by programming this park, by having activities that were programmed and various reasons to come here, that this could really be a source of community and a source of community life in a place that really had very little to no community because it was either industrial uses up to this point or transit uses up to this point, um, but no office and no residential. Back in 2006, so that's how many years ago? Uh, 11 years ago. Uh, people thought that no one would go up to a park on the roof. Since then, the High Line has been completed. Everyone wants a High Line in all different cities, and no one really is that shocked when you say there's a park that's 70 feet above the ground. But at the time, these connections and these views up were really important because we wanted people to understand that there was three-dimensional space up there that they could go to and inhabit. And so we had proposed that we highlight those spaces so that from above, they're memorable and iconic for the people looking down on them, but also for the people below. And this is from the bus deck level looking up um, on the constructed project today. This is from the street. Um, two streets go underneath this building. Uh, so as people come into San Francisco from the East Bay and off the bridge, they drive under this building. It's sort of a gateway to downtown. Um, and you can see up there and you can see that there's a park um, from all different angles. In the competition, we had also proposed a funicular or a gondola that brings people from the public plaza at the street level, which was part of the competition, up through native California redwoods to a redwood grove up at the park level. And that's something that actually remained. The gondola remained and the developer of this building built the gondola, but the group that leased this building didn't like having redwoods between what they were looking at here uh, and the other lobby that they rented across the street. And so the redwoods didn't make it. So you have a much less exciting trip up to the park because you just go through an open space uh, and look down at an open plaza. That said, all of these green uh, dots are ways to get from the ground level up to the park. On the streets that go underneath the building, which one of them is here, Fremont Street, one of them is here, First Street, and a third is a pedestrian alley that go underneath. All of those locations have elevators from the sidewalk that bring you up to the park directly from the sidewalk. And then uh, in yellow are the bridges that I mentioned that come from the buildings around. Rather than being five acres of one big square where you could have a giant concert or the Pope could come and thousands and thousands of people could come and listen to one person speaking, uh, this is a park that's really like a collection of four or five neighborhood parks. Because it's about 150 feet wide and 1,500 feet long, everyone wouldn't hear each other or see each other if they all came at the same time. And so overall, um, about 6,000 or 7,000 people can be on the park at one time. And there are all these different activities that are happening uh, or spaces and places to go and see. What we also did is we wanted to create a topography here. We didn't want it to feel like a roof deck, like you went up on top of a building and you saw all of these air conditioning or elevator head houses. And so we rolled the landscape over the stairwells and over the elevator head houses um, and we used vines to green the architecture that was inside. And we also worked with the architect to, to create domed skylights. So you get a topography of glass and ground cover and planting and grass um, that goes down the middle of the park, as you can see here. Because just underneath, the buses drive around like this. They come off the Bay Bridge and drive like this underneath here. The elevators, escalators, and stairs couldn't be around the edges because they would have blocked the bus uh, route. So that's why all of the skylights and all of the penetrations in the building have to run down the center, which then means that you don't have so much contiguous space in the park. And so this was something that we were trying to balance together with the rest of the team. So you can see here, if we had a flat park, you'd have all of these pop-ups that would block you as you looked. And so what we did was we rolled and created this topography that runs down the park as we move through. And so that created spaces that were flat at the center, which is a plaza and gathering space, 
and more rolling and mounded on the ends, which would mean that there was more contemplative spaces and places for people to spend time passively. We also focused on a very, very heavily botanical kind of program so that people could experience green and various plants that are specifically suited to San Francisco um, that they wouldn't see and don't see anywhere uh, in the neighborhood or on the ground. We also worked with Ned Kahn, the environmental artist, from the competition. He had the idea to harness the movement of buses to create uh, an activity and an action on the park level. And so the buses themselves, as they drive below, trigger sensors in the ceiling of the level below that relate to and are connected to um, jets. And so the jets measure the length of a bus and move at the speed of a bus as the bus moves down uh, the park. And so this is the actual constructed one and that's actually the length of a bus right there. The park itself we had proposed um, would have uh, a very planted edge that was all about um, habitat and horticulture. Um, so that we have spe specific uh, special gardens all around, but people also aren't allowed to walk in those special gardens. So flying members of San Francisco are also invited up and they're around the edges of the park. But the center is really what we see as the social part. The plaza in the center, a big picnic lawn, an amphitheater, a restaurant eventually, and then a meadow that people can move through and spend time in. So around the edge, we focused on creating feature gardens that have botanical interest year round. Uh, a large one on the north is focused on California uh, plants. This is an image of the finished project showing the plant rail, which keeps people out, um, but allows uh, flying creatures and even crawling creatures in. Um, it also became the uh, armature for a communications and an interpretational signage program that talks about both the plants but also the technology of the building. One of the special gardens at the far eastern end is a wetland garden and it has plants that grow only in wet substrate. It has a system kind of like the Glenstone uh, courtyard pond um, but what it does is receives gray water from the sinks in the building below it to polish up top and then reuse and resend that uh, polished gray water back down to those restrooms so that that water could be used uh, in the toilets and the urinals. And this is sort of a pilot project that we worked with the Public Utilities Commission in San Francisco uh, and also the planning department because gray water wasn't allowed to be used to irrigate plants on commercial projects in San Francisco when we won the project. But during the time, since it did take eight years or nine, um, we were able to make that uh, a reality by the end. It's hard when you design a park that's really focused on a vast variety of very large trees to design something, send it off for bidding, and then have it constructed five years later when there's been an economic downturn and a lot of nurseries have gone out of business. And so this was the color-coded tree plan that was part of our tree tagging uh, kit because we had to go to nurseries to try to tag the trees that were meant to go there. But if they didn't have those species, this was something that at a quick glance, you can see how the design worked, what trees by color were meant to relate to what other trees um, so that if you were trying to get a May 10 and May 10s weren't available, you were able to switch it to something else um, and you knew it was a standalone and it could be anything. But you also had to know that that was the Chilean garden. So your anything had to be something that came from Chile, which was not easy. Um, we went to all these different nurseries, uh, all in California. Um, and the project uh, had to have uh, a pre-grow nursery. The contractor was required to acclimate these plants to our area nearby. And so they were in this nursery for about 18 months or one year um, so that they settled because when you move plants up to the fifth story of a building, you don't want them to have a problem acclimating up there uh, after the crane leaves. So this is a way that we knew uh, that things would likely be successful. The other thing that we did is working with all the engineers we worked with, they modeled the building, they looked at all of the influences um, we knew where the sun was coming, we knew where the wind was coming, and we did a planting plan that related to that. But what we didn't know is that there was another boom cycle about to happen in San Francisco, 
And all of the towers that we thought would take 20 years to build all got built in 10 years. And a lot of them have uh, very reflective glass. And so what you see here is the silhouette reflection of these palms because the sun is coming from the other side across the palms and having them reflect into a mirrored building on, in front of it. And then those silhouettes are being projected back onto the building. The point is just to say, you can do all of the work. You can work with very you know, highly specialized technicians and engineers and not know what you're gonna get on a site. Um, and so these plants uh, ended up getting sun from two to three directions at one time, um, which means our focus on subtropical and very drought tolerant plants was something that is good and should be resilient and has allowed them to, for the most part, uh, be successful at least for the last two years since they've been installed. This was during installation. You can see foam being used, which is the white, um, which is what was used to raise the grade. We tried to keep as much soil contiguous as possible. So it's an average of three feet of soil over the whole park, but the depth of soil varies from 18 inches to four and a half feet, but the top 18 inches is contiguous. So all of these trees' roots are allowed to go horizontally as far as they're able and to intermingle with each other. And this is that palm garden today uh, from the other side. And this is looking down from Salesforce Tower on a, on a moderately active day. The picnic lawn being picnicked, and it's very hot. I mean, San Francisco is quite a cool place. Um, everyone was afraid that, you know, it, 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 it was happy that 70 feet in the air and facing south, you get a lot more sun than down on the ground in this area. It's ended up, everyone's congregating in the shade because it's very warm uh, in this place because of all of the reflected sun. We've worked with Biederman Redevelopment Ventures, which is who we were hoping would get the job. They're who um, programs and thought of programming Bryant Park in New York to the level that they do. Um, they've organized a series of regular kinds of activities like our competition proposal, which was that schedule at the beginning of the presentation. So this yoga class happens a number of times a week uh, on the amphitheater lawn. Um, and this is just informal gathering there's a bar uh, on the plaza at the center of the space. And these are all the kind of activities that happen. And up here, you can see a aerobics or a Zumba class happening on top of the glass paving in the center of the part of the plaza, which is actually a skylight to the area below in the grand hall. Um, and that um, is down here. So the light column connects, the light column back there connects to this uh, flat, uh, skylight, which the escalator that goes up from the Grand, Grand Hall is under all the way along. And so here uh, you have a moment uh, with a salsa class or a salsa day on top, uh, both from above and below. And so uh, I think, I mean, what's, what's happened is that people have really understood that there's a park there and they're using it but I don't know if anyone had heard it was closed about six weeks after it opened because they found a crack in one of the beams that went over the road, which was a horror for the city and for us and for the whole team. It was a construction problem uh, they found uh, after it was investigated, but it was closed for about 10 months. And during that entire time, it was being used uh, by the flying members of San Francisco. And there are more hummingbirds up here on any day than anywhere else I know of in the city. So that's about where we are, um, and it's, I think, the end of my time here. But the last project, and I'll just run through the images, and we can chat about it outside uh, at the uh, reception if you want, um, is the most unreal project that we've done, which is uh, a garden and a park under glass uh, in Singapore at the airport. And really, this is about making a new type of airport that's a destination for the people in the city that the airport is in. It's a mall that runs around in a donut shape around a circle uh, here. And the center is this terraced landscape uh, with a park and a garden that runs around on top. So overall, this area is about five and a half acres, the same 
uh, area as the Salesforce Park, um, but you can also see connections and suggestions of the Barangaroo terraced landscape uh, inside of there. I think what it's become uh, or is becoming is one of the most oddly integrated outdoor-indoor feeling uh, experience that you can go to, um, but it's entirely indoors with views to very, uh, very maintained and very managed landscapes because it's in a completely climate-controlled area. And so I think with all of these projects, on all of the other projects we've looked at, um, people can think that landscapes can exist on their own, that once you design them and once you build them, they'll live till they mature, um, which isn't true, no matter where they're planted and no matter where they're designed. I think what this project does uh, is really um, make it clear that to everyone who goes there that it can only exist because people take care of it and people have made it be. And I think that's true about more and more of the places that people think of as natural as we move through time. So I think that ends uh, my presentation. Well, I think one thing that's true about our office, and it's been around for about 35 years, is that it has always done projects that were in close relationship to architects and to cities and urban design. Um, I think, if anything, we've been uh, focused you know, more on uh, natural systems and more true landscape you know, as far as living systems go. Uh, lately, even when it's quite tied to architectural constructions. Um, so I think the thing that's changed is that, the, that engineers and architects and cities are all looking more and more to work with landscape and natural systems and landscape architects. So as you do that, you need to be aware of the catch points and problems that... Um, come up if the requirements for what we do are not provided for or assumed or accounted for in the big picture planning or infrastructural planning of these projects. And so the, the fact and the need for an average of three feet of soil or the need for drainage or the need for connected root space um, are all things that you need to bring up and bring on early on You know, with all of these different parties um, that might want the idea of a park and they want a park and parks are great, except they're not ready to uh, treat, pay for, design, you know, the support system uh, for, for those kinds of landscape systems. And I think that's something that um, is political and economic as well as environmental and you know design focused and so trying to keep all of those things in mind and know how to bring them up and how to push hard and push softly and not even push but get it in without people noticing are, are all the things that we've been uh, trying to perfect or eke out mm -hmm. So that's, a, I mean, that's what I said, <laughs> you know, and not, not, not why put it inside of an airport, but why I said, why put a fantastic tropical garden inside of a glass? You know, I mean, I, Singapore, we've done some projects there and I've done some and, and I love tropical plants. Um, it's much easier to grow tropical plants outdoors in the tropics than it is to grow something that feels like tropical plants in a climate controlled building. Um, <laughs> And so, but people don't spend time outdoors in Singapore in the daytime. 
Um, and, and I know that sounds like a, a write-off, but it's true. Um, that, you know, most of the outdoor life happens, uh, recreational life happens in the morning or the evening uh, or night. Um, and so this was a, was a design competition, actually. That the brief was um, from the airport was we want to transform what is a surface parking lot in the middle of the airport outside of security in between the three main terminals. And that um, brief was uh, to make a mall because they wanted a mall and an attraction. And so developers came with designers and they proposed different things. And the other designers proposed attractions. One had a Universal Studios like kind of attraction. Another had something related to dinosaurs and monsters. These were rides and things like that. With Moshe Softy, he had this idea to create what he was calling the marketplace, which was the mall, and the garden side by side or on top of each other. And I think that idea of doing these two things, because Singapore is known as the city in a garden, to do these two things, it's also known for more shopping malls than any other <laughs> city or state. Um, doing these two things together uh, and making them comfortable and accessible all day uh, was something that really rang true to, uh, to the, the, the airport and the organizers and led to us winning the project. Um, but why does it make sense? The Singapore airport has a subway system that brings you from downtown or from various places to the airport. This took a space that was really used only for surface parking for people going places and has made it a place of activity and a destination. Um, it's used by 60 to 70% Singaporeans at the moment and then 30 to 40% uh, transit uh, people. So I think when you, th when you think of infrastructure, big scale infrastructure that's built in cities all over the world that are focused on one thing usually, like airports are for travelers and traveling and planes. This is expanding really the use of the land, you know, uh, at that location. So I think that's why it makes sense. Um, and then it does make sense to me um, because it's a remarkable construction that is doing very well, meaning the, the interaction between environmental engineers and architects and structural engineers and landscape architects and horticulturalists uh, and glazing specialists, all of that had to be done with a focus on human comfort and plant comfort and pulling that together and having all of these professionals thinking about these things that they don't normally think about when they stay in their silos or in their separate track, I think is a good thing related to the design of places all over the world, meaning not just attractions, but sort of the evolution of design fields together thinking about varying things. Um, I can see like most, like all these projects are like super oriented with like integrating nature and building to like a single like environment. Mm. Um, how would you say like climate change has impacted like these designs like especially like going like from the start of like the early 2000s where it's like not seems a big deal of, like now where it's kind of like on the forefront of like global issues mm -hmm. um sorry the, well the 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 i mean that's the thing that's i think we've and we as landscape architects trained say 20 years ago you know uh, have been focused in some ways on the environment and change, you know, climate change personally, you know, through time. And thinking about resilient landscapes has been a focus of what we try to do when we think about trying to create landscapes that last through time. Um, so I think those things are true and continue uh, and remain. But I think the idea that every, that all land you know, is affected by climate change and that there are all different kinds of um, tactics that we'll need to use to design any space, you know, whether they're inside of a glass dome and that's how you keep things, uh, you know, living or outside, you know, and responsive to the changes around them. I think the kind of things we use as landscape architects 
have remained the same. It's just what you uh, put into the analysis, the site analysis, and the projection of what um, the places you design are going to have to withstand. Because floods, you know, the 100-year flood line was always important on sites. If the 100-year flood happens every five years, it's more important than it was before, and maybe it's a different line you need to look for. But I think we were always used to identifying the key issues and trying to design towards those things. Mm -hmm. um, well, I think that's definitely, I hope, what you could see in some of in, in these projects, you know, is that um, in different ways, the planting in each of these projects, I think, forms um, part of the identity of each project. Um, and in the case of the Glenstone Meadow, for example, or the bush planting up the terraces of um, Barangaroo, both of those planted systems have, say, 50 to 100 species all inside of that thing that reads as a whole, meaning the bush looks like just a green slope, the meadow looks like rolling green, but there's a complexity inside of it that is not expressed in the, in the big picture view. So I think we think of things and, and try to design related to, this, to scale of each place, whether it's about the human scale that someone's standing in and doing and creating a bosque of trees that you feel like you're standing under and surrounded by and that that bosque of trees is a, a volume, like in a very architectural sense, or the ring of palms around the um, light well, or uh, grand scale, you know, landscape scale, where the, the rolling meadows create an impact because they look uniform, even though they're very complex, or the hill in Barangaroo. So I think bouncing back and forth between trying to create things that are complex and enhance uh, both the understanding and the identity of a design, but also the environment and the potential for the um, performance of each of these landscapes is something we try to do in all of our work. Maintenance plans. So we're so on Transbay, the park, we're doing a maintenance plan, uh, maintenance manual right now, a year after the project opened. Um, as part of the design and, and construction documents, the installing contractor was res is responsible for maintenance for one year, um, or two years actually, sorry. Um, we tried to propose that the owner contract us to do a maintenance plan during the design phase. They didn't respond so much. <laughs> but, um, but since they uh, supported the complexity of the planting and are, have been excited and happy with the results, they also see the need and, the, and have a desire for a longer term um, maintenance manual. And that's something that on that project we're doing. But I think that's the balance. It, with Glenstone, we've been working with that owner for over 15 years. Um, we've maintained a relationship through continued projects and through visits and, and, uh, and write-ups basically with their maintenance team. So it's an informal process. With Transbay, it's turning into a more formal product that we give them. And I think um, as time goes on, that's what I guess I'm saying is that I hope that the understanding that management and maintenance are required as part of these ongoing living constructions um, will become more understood and people will be more open to contract with a designer or uh, a consultant to make those things. It's something that hasn't been as easy as, uh, well, and none of it's easy, but um, it's been more straightforward to say, we want to design for this, so we'll pay you to do a design for this, not um, we'll pay you to do a maintenance plan for the thing that you got paid for to design.
agents downstairs. <laughs> Potentially in the courtyard space, somewhere nearby. So, if you have more questions, we're going to talk to Adam. Thank you. Thank you.